This week on NJ Business Beat, no relief for now. The latest legal troubles for the student loan forgiveness program and what advocates want the president to do during this setback. Plus, we travel to Atlantic City for a toast to New Jersey wine as the state celebrates Wine Week. And with food prices skyrocketing, we put New Jersey's food industry in focus. From growing food manufacturing businesses to the state's historic farmlands and how groups are tackling food insecurity in our state. That's ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining me on NJ Business Beat. 40 million student loan borrowers could be just weeks away from having to start repaying their debt after a series of legal setbacks put the Biden administration's federal student loan debt relief program on ice. The U.S. Education Department is warning of an historically large increase in student loan defaults without debt forgiveness, saying 18 million borrowers are at risk. The Biden administration is appealing recent court decisions, but advocates say it's time to do more. They want the administration to extend the moratorium on debt repayments, which expires at the end of the year. I spoke with Cody Hunanian, executive director of the Student Debt Crisis Center. Cody, there must be a lot of disappointment in your organization based on the legal matters here that have really put a roadblock into the student loan forgiveness plan. What are you thinking about right now in terms of potential steps you'd like to see happen next? The fight isn't over. So as far as debt cancellation goes, we are right behind this administration in uh, continuing to fight. The Department of Justice has already submitted an appeals and we're gonna continue to monitor the legal process here. But we're also speaking on behalf of the borrowers. And we want this administration to extend the federal student loan payment pause until the legal process is complete and debt is canceled. You know, keep in mind, the entire point of debt cancellation, according to the president, is to provide repair to the harm caused by the pandemic. And your organization recently conducted a survey that found that many borrowers are really thinking about this moratorium as a lifeline and financially they are not in good shape to resume payments. That's right. You know, two thirds of the 31,000 people that we surveyed said that they have yet to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic and health crises that that caused. You add to that, you know, skyrocketing inflation and the economic shifts that Americans are facing today. And, and many borrowers are on financial thin ice. And uh, you're, you're also correct that a large, vast majority of borrowers say they still depend on the pandemic relief that's been issued since March of 2020. So we cannot right now, one, while the economy is so uncertain for borrowers, and two, when the future of student loan policy is so uncertain, push 40 million Americans back into repayment and also back into a system that we know is broken. What do you think right now is priority number one in terms of a fix? What would you like to see kind of happen as this debate about repayment continues, but what can make it better for students that have debt and students going forward that will have debt in the future? Step one is providing immediate relief to borrowers. You know, we cannot have millions of Americans have hundreds or thousands of dollars ripped out of their pockets right now uh, because of the student loan payments restarting. So we need to provide that relief. That's the triage. That's how we make sure that Americans are financially secure as we continue to work towards the transformative policy of debt cancellation and then fixing the system. Cody, good to catch up with you once again on this very important topic. Thanks for your time. Thank you as well. We appreciate being uh, having the opportunity to talk about this. The State League of Municipalities held its annual conference in Atlantic City this week, and taxes were a big topic of conversation. Top legislative leaders telling municipal officials that affordability remains a priority, but they stopped short of promising any assistance to offset rising health care costs for public workers. 
Local government officials have warned those rising costs could lead to higher property taxes. Meantime, there were several panel discussions on a wide variety of topics, including the state's expanding cannabis industry. One prospective cannabis business owner went to the conference to learn how individual municipalities are implementing their marijuana programs. Dwight Brandon says one of the major roadblocks is finding a place to lease. A lot of the owners of the warehouses, if you want to do a cultivator and you want to grow inside a warehouse, a lot of those guys are, don't believe in cannabis and they'll gouge you and they're like, you know, they don't have to lease to you because they got a trucking company coming in or they have shop right. At the conference, Senate President Nicholas Scutari said the move to legalize recreational marijuana provides new revenue streams for municipalities. And he also noted New Jersey has benefited from higher revenues in recent years and has been giving money back to taxpayers, citing the new Anchor Property Tax Relief Program. But New Jersey could potentially give even more money back. The state has about a billion dollars in pandemic relief funds that must be allocated. It has a couple of years to do that, although NJ Spotlight's budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer says some do not think the state should wait. You do have a lot of groups out there who see the state with over a billion dollars left in the, in the bank account and saying, you know, we have a lot of needs in New Jersey, ranging from homelessness to, you know, small businesses still struggling. Let's see some of this money go out on the street. Streets are busier and commuter trains are more crowded these days as more workers return to the office, at least for part of the week. NJ Transit says rail ridership is about 70 percent of pre-pandemic levels, with ridership highest Tuesdays through Thursdays. Meantime, Lincoln Tunnel traffic has now surpassed pre-pandemic levels. The commuter congestion comes even though a survey finds most workers remain on a hybrid schedule. The partnership for New York City found that as of mid-September, 49 percent of workers are back in their Manhattan offices going in two to three days a week. Only 9 percent are working in the office five days a week. If your December travel plans will take you through Newark Airport's Terminal A, you are in for a pleasant surprise. A ribbon cutting was held at the airport this week to mark the Port Authority's $2.7 billion makeover of the terminal. Governor Murphy, First Lady Tammy Murphy and Newark Mayor Raz Baraka joined Port Authority officials for the occasion. Governor Murphy says the expanded and updated terminal is expected to generate $4.6 billion for the regional economy and create more than 2,500 jobs. Terminal A features new retail and dining options, artwork from Jersey artists, and a faster boarding process for air travelers. And we have worked hard to create a truly New Jersey sense of place and doing it all with attention to minority and women-owned businesses and to community involvement in the airport. This building and the experience in this building will literally transform what people think and how they think about New Jersey. It's a, it's a game changer. New Jersey's wineries were expected to have brisk business this weekend, as this is New Jersey Wine Week. You may not know that the wine industry is one of the fastest growing segments of the state's agricultural business. Wine Week kicked off at the Governor's Mansion, where the Governor and First Lady attended the Governor's Cup. That's the Garden State Wine Growers Association's annual competition honoring the state's wines and wineries. You're looking at this year's winning wines. Other events were held throughout the state, including this gathering at Tennessee Avenue Beer Hall in Atlantic City, where the restaurant's owners feature different New Jersey wines each month. Jeffrey Vassar, the executive director at the Division of Travel and Tourism, among those attending and participating in an official toast. Cheers to New Jersey wine! To find out more about the wine industry's economic impact on the state, I spoke with Devin Perry, executive director of the Garden State Wine Growers Association. Devin, it's great to talk to you during Wine Week. Thank you for having me today. You are really on a mission to elevate the status of New Jersey wines. Why are events being held this week a way to do that? 
During New Jersey Wine Week, it gives us an opportunity as the Garden State Wine Growers Association to remind the state that we keep the garden in the garden state. What we're looking to do truly is let the residents of New Jersey know that they do not have to fly anywhere to experience award-winning wines. We have them all right here. Tell me about the growth that we've seen in the wine industry in New Jersey and where would you like it to go? So in 2022, we're actually celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the Judgment of Princeton, which was a double blind tasting that took place in 2012. Double blind because our wines were being challenged by California and France. Flash forward to 22, we're 10 years after the Judgment of Princeton, our wines performed very well against the French and the Californian wines. And our goal really is to say that agritourism is critically important to the state's economy. And so an investment in a bottle of wine from New Jersey is actually an investment in jobs, um, in other ancillary businesses that are supported by our industry. And there are a lot of young folks that are interested in getting involved. So they're moving from vines to tasting rooms, from the classroom to management. There's already quite an economic impact from the wine industry. Throw some numbers at me. Tell me what we're seeing right now with New Jersey's economy and wine. We have seen, I believe, over the past year, um, over $4.5 billion of economic impact, and we've driven over 270,000 visitations. So what that means is visitors come to our wineries, and from there they explore historic destinations, they eat at our restaurants, and they have overnight stays at our hotels, filling up on gas and doing all sorts of other things. So. We love the fact that we can drive more economic impact for other sectors of hospitality and tourism. Farming is a tough business and New Jersey's not immune from some of the challenges. Are the wineries profitable? How are they doing as businesses in the state? We're all family owned, all of the 60 plus wineries in the state. So really it depends on how their you know, their fixed costs and their variable costs interplay. And because climate issues are, you know, uh, on the table when it comes to our industry, variability with the weather, there are some things that cannot be controlled, you know, day by day. Some of our wineries actually have to invest in helicopters and other tools when it gets either too hot or too cold. Um, and so that can be a challenge. But the good thing is that with the help of the Garden State Wine Growers Association, we are driving more business to the tasting rooms. So our hope is that that helps to offset some of the variable costs that they experience day to day. Let's talk about the wine that you and I have here Shall from we? a local winery. <laughs> Tell me about the winery and this particular wine being featured this month um, at this restaurant chain in Atlantic City. So we are sitting in Tennessee, along Tennessee Avenue at Bar 32 right now, which is one of several restaurants owned by Mark and Nicole. And this is Sharet wine. So what you're drinking is the award-winning Tango, which recently, actually Monday, November 14th, received an award from the governor and the first lady. Um, what I'm drinking is, hold on, I'll tell you in a second. I think it's their Sauvignon Blanc, and I could be wrong, but I believe it's their Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> this wine is quite good. Yes. Are New Jersey wines being consumed outside of New Jersey, or is this our little secret? So our wines are being consumed outside of New Jersey, thanks to shipping legislation that was passed a little while ago. Um, in addition, some of our wines are actually featured at restaurants in Philadelphia. Tell me about the motto whether you're watching movies and New Jersey is the butt of a joke, for example, or if a laugh track does follow us around as an industry because people just don't know yet how awesome we are. So what we decided was to play off that and our motto is we're growing on you, New Jersey. And so all across the Garden State, you'll see billboards with we're growing on you. And at every rest stop and even at the Philadelphia International Airport, we have Great information for everyone, but we are rooted in that line to remind people that you know, our 15, over 1,500 acres of vines are literally growing on the Garden State. Devin, it's been really great to talk to you during Wine Week. Cheers. Cheers to New Jersey wine. From wine to food, this week on NJ Business Beat, we're putting the business of feeding New Jersey in focus. From Campbell Soup Company in Camden to Goya Foods in Jersey City, New Jersey is home to leading food companies. 
Food manufacturing accounts for $4.4 billion in economic output. It's the fourth largest manufacturing industry in the state. There are just under 1,300 food manufacturers employing more than 35,000 workers. The Garden State also has about 10,000 farms growing more than 100 crops. One New Jersey farming town, Hamilton, is known as the blueberry capital of the world, and those tiny berries are the state's biggest crop, with a production value of $78 million. That's followed by corn at over $71 million, soybeans with a production value of over $55 million, and then there's peppers at nearly $49 million. Here in the Garden State, there's been increased interest in organic farming, but farming is a tough business. I spoke to Devin Cornea, the executive director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association in New Jersey, about the many challenges facing New Jersey's organic farms. Devin, what have we seen in the past couple of years in terms of uh, growth in organic farming here in New Jersey? So we've seen from my experience, a lot more interest, but we haven't actually seen the growth of enough farms. So just as many farms are opting to cease operation, I feel as we're actually finding new farmers beginning. And I use vague terms, I feel, I find, because one of the main issues with organic farmers is that they're not tapped into traditional USDA surveys and statistical services. So it's really hard to get a hold on just how many folks are farming in New Jersey, and they're farming organically. What is the difficulty in getting a business started? We know, for instance, the costs of farmland continues to rise. Is it that, or is it finding and markets, or just having enough money to get the business started? Land access is by far the most difficult and pressing issue in New Jersey. You know, we're such a small state. We boast an incredible farmland and preservation program, but the property value is constantly rising. Uh, they, they box a lot of farmers out from ever getting a start. It's actually infrastructure, I would say, is the next big hurdle, you know, being able to finance and afford the infrastructure needed. I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking we are in the Garden State after all. So should there be some more efforts, state policy or something um, beyond just kind of grassroots support for some of these farmers? If you could change anything on that front, what would it be? two things. One would be institutional purchasing, trying to make sure that these large institutions that essentially are guaranteed markets for our farmers can be accessed by all farmers in the state, from schools to hospitals. Those are daily dollars being spent on food. And the more we can push that towards local, the better we'll all, we'll all be. Our communities will you know, be a little more vibrant and a little more healthy. And the second thing that I think would be really important is more support, more uh, financial aid, and more attention given to education, extension, resources through our land-grant universities. Organic produce and other goods typically cost more um, than others. Is there any issue with inflation? Are any customers backing away from organic because of the higher price points? So we need to educate the public to reflect the realities of farming, whether it's organic or non-organic. Organic farms typically are less mechanized. They rely more on human labor. They obviously don't have as many tools in their tool belt as non-organic farms, and therefore kind of pigeonholed to producing a certain way with certain costs. Now with such volatility in the world and increasing costs all throughout, you know, farmers' inputs, a farmer's labor, that price is now reflected in the market. But the consumer doesn't always make the connection between input costs and, you know, a farmer's what they need to actually take home a living. We'll end it there, Devin. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck with things. Thank you. One New Jersey food manufacturer recently celebrated the expansion of its Gloucester County factory after seeing meteoric sales growth over the last few years. Gluten-free food company Dr. Shar invested $18 million on the expansion, doubling its capacity. Hannes Berger, the CEO and president of Dr. Shar North America, talked to me about what's driving business and why they chose New Jersey to host their company. 
Thanks for joining me on the show today and congratulations on the recent expansion that you celebrated. What's driving your business that uh, you got to the point where expansion was welcome? We doubled our capacity there and, and clearly there was a need and a demand in the US market for that as we are striving for market leadership. Let's talk about how your sales have grown, what you can share with me over the last couple of years. We know it seems that more people are eating gluten-free, um, some because they have to, some because they choose to. What has that done to your business? Yeah, let me step back a little bit if I can. Let's say we had a decade sure. where, where the gluten-free uh, gluten market grew a lot in the whole United States and also in Canada. The reason was that it was not only, let's say, a medical need for that, for people suffering from celiac disease, including intolerances, but it was a kind also a way of life, you know, where people were used to eat gluten. It was a wave coming from the West Coast. It was uh, a lot on the press. And therefore, the market and demand for gluten-free product was kind of exploding for 10 years, like 20% of CAGR every year. Over the last years, I think if you say the last two years, I would say, let me say the last four years, we more than doubled our business over the last four years. I'm saying that because in the middle of these four years, as you know, was the pandemic. And the pandemic had a very positive effect on the demand of our product, that, uh, as we have seen in a lot of other industries, especially CPG companies. So over the last four years, we more than doubled. And if we look at the last two years, I would say it's more than 50% that we grew our business. And finally, why do you call New Jersey home? Why is it important for you to have a presence here? We selected the East Coast because it is close to, let's say, to uh, especially New Jersey, to two big airports. And it was also important to have a maximum of six hours time difference to Europe in order to collaborate and work together. So I think that was one of the really big decisions why we came into the East Coast and then even more into New Jersey, where we saw there is a lot of workforce and a lot of European big CPG companies are already settled in New Jersey. So we found it, for, especially for finding the right workforce, the right place to be. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and where your company is heading next. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. This year, your Thanksgiving dinner will cost 20% more due to inflation. With costs increasing, food pantries here in New Jersey and across the country are seeing a greater need. Food insecurity is an issue for more than 657,000 people in our state, about 7% of New Jersey's population. And that includes nearly 176,000 children, or 9% of all children living in New Jersey. In Atlantic County, 15% of households face food insecurity. That's the highest rate in the state. But as the need rises, donations are not matching that need. That's what I learned after speaking with Adele LaTourette, Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Adele, as we start to head into the holiday season, give us a status report with how the Community Food Bank is doing in terms of the need and whether you're able to meet it. Well, we are trying. Um, you know, we have seen as a result of inflation, a 40% increase in the cost of turkeys and a 50% increase in the cost of roasters. So we are working to make sure that everyone has what they need. Uh, we're also offering Thanksgiving boxes with all the trimmings. So, um, Again, we do anticipate trying to meet as much as we possibly can, but anything that people can do to help is really would be helpful. How are donations coming in? You mentioned inflation. So obviously I know that is a struggle for you and many other people, and it costs more pretty much for everything. So are your donations keeping up? No, donations are down. That's very challenging for us, but we also understand that it's challenging for the people who donate to us. Um, you know, we would have people who would, on their regular shopping trips, pick up an extra item or two um, and donate it to the food bank. And that is simply not happening because those items have gotten much more expensive. So, yes, donations overall are absolutely down. And that would include corporate donations as well? 
Yep, that includes corporate donations. Everyone is seeing the squeeze. And what that means is people in need are seeing the squeeze and it just, just goes all up, you know, up the whole chain. What is the outlook, do you think, as we head into 2023, if we continue to see these challenges with inflation? I mean, in my mind, the need will probably be greater. More people might be turning to the food bank that in the past did not. Nationwide and in New Jersey, we are seeing numbers of people served at food pantries over the numbers served during the pandemic. What's happened is during the pandemic, we saw federal intervention expansion of federal feeding programs and free meals and free summer food, um, all kinds of different waivers and incentives. Those, for the most part, have gone away. Is there a, a need for some sort of national helps, funding, uh, any sort of relief? I mean, how are you going to be able to manage this without some assistance coming in? Well, simply said, we can't. Um, yes, we have uh, a couple of important pieces of legislation we hope will go through. We have the child nutrition reauthorization. We need to see universal meals back in the classrooms across the state of New Jersey and across the country. Listen, I wish you the best of luck. It's going to be a hard couple of weeks. Thank you for all you do to feed New Jersey's hungry. Thank you so much. And that does it for us this week. Remember to subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. We are on hiatus next week for the Thanksgiving holiday, but we'll see you right back here in two weeks. Enjoy the holiday and the rest of your weekend. And thank you for watching NJ Business Beat.